Dark Souls 2 is good. Kinda. It's strange. It struggles to make it out of the bottom of a lot of people's lists of best Souls games, but the ones who do put it at the top of theirs will not shut up about it. But before we start nitpicking the most divisive Souls titles so far, let me set the stage for a second. I started my Dark Souls journey with Dark Souls 1 in 2012. It was a pretty rocky start. The combat didn't click for me for a while. After dying to the Asylum Demon for an hour, I gave up for quite a while before returning and falling deeply in love with the game. Absolutely convinced that Dark Souls 2 would live up to the precedent set by DS1, I pre-ordered it. Why not? And when I booted up the game on my Xbox 360, I suddenly wondered if I had made a mistake. I'd played plenty of awful sequels before. Would this game live up to the hype I had given it? Well, yeah. I l What the fuck is this? Oh fuck. Is all the footage like this? Uh, why didn't I check before I played the entire damn game? Fuck it, I'll do New Game Plus. I loved DS2. I played it more than DS1 and engaged with PvP much more than I have with pretty much any other game in the series, even to this day. While very different in its feel, DS2 was a lovely romp through bleak environments and novel enemy design. The bosses were mostly easy, but I still had a couple of roadblocks. Felstat comes to mind for sure. And when the DLCs came out, I loved them too. Cracks were beginning to show in the actual level design. Enemy placements and move sets were becoming a bit aggravating, but they were explicitly designed to be endgame content. So I gave it a pass. Boss reuse was fine in parts. Blue Smelter Demon was odd, but it was a one-off, so surely that's fine, right? And the fights with Raim, Alon, and the old Ivory King are some of the coolest in the series. I could forgive the flaws, really, because the highs were so astronomically high. I felt like I had played out DS2 eventually. I'd done all I wanted to, got all the achievements, and was ready for new games. When the announcement came that DS2 was getting an all new revamp to make it harder, let me tell you, I was pumped. This game I loved was going to feel fresh again. But at the time I didn't have a whole bunch of money, so I had to wait to get it myself. I did get it eventually though. And fuck it sucked! I wouldn't have to get far into my first playthrough before the game started to feel wrong. Levels felt more claustrophobic than ever. The enemy placement was bizarre at best and infuriating at worst. Items were moved seemingly at random. What the fuck had happened to this game? I didn't finish it. I put it down and didn't pick it back up for years. Fast forward and I've picked up streaming as a hobby, shameless plug by the way. And I mentioned that I've never finished Scholar. Two regulars of my community at the time, Jupiter and Mark Viper, do a co-op playthrough of Scholar with me, and it's pretty fun. The entire time though, I was bitching about the level design. For Jupiter and Mark, who love DS2, I bet this was pretty frustrating. I had a blast with the run, but I felt like the fun that I was having was the result of playing with my friends, not from the game itself. And here we are post Let's Play era for my channel and finally I can sit down and explain how FromSoft took a good game and ruined it. It's impossible to go through and list every single thing that FromSoft changed when making Scholar. Some changes are great, like Covenant stuff and the PvP is virtually unchanged between versions. From what I've seen, PvP is the reason for the majority of people loving DS2 and I completely understand. But I'm not much of a PvPer, I certainly dabble in each game, but I play Souls for the PvE experience mostly. And this is what I want to focus on because the changes in the PvE, particularly in enemy placement, are nothing short of fucking moronic. I'm going to go through most of the levels that stand out to me as being particularly egregious when it comes to the changes made, 
and it may feel nitpicky, but let me tell you, having played both for this video, and vanilla twice, I know exactly which one I enjoyed more. And it wasn't Scholar. Oh boy, we're not off to a good start if I'm nitpicking the fucking tutorial level. This does begin something that I will bring up over and over again though, and that's the fact that for some reason, Scholar is obsessed with getting you to go back to places you've already been. It's like they took the comparisons to Metroidvanias that some critics had about DS1 and said, you know what, let's lean into that. Without thinking that not even in DS1 were levels particularly designed to be revisited in any meaningful way. A shortcut to the Undead Berg here, another to Firelink there, but all just to make boss runs easier. It was extremely rare to have to revisit areas at all if you had a route down. Which brings me to my point. Why the fuck is there an area blocked off by a petrified statue here? In the tutorial area. What does this teach the player other than that the game has blocked paths? Unless you remember that this statue exists later down the line, which is very unlikely, then the coffin that allows you to remake your character is just not available ever. Not only that, but the closest fragrant branches are the ones sold from Melentia for 12k souls, way out of the reach for players just starting. No Man's Wharf and the Lost Bastille. Plenty of time for a player to forget that that statue even exists. And if you do remember, and use one of your valuable branches on it, let's wait for 15 fucking minutes while it revivifies. Hey, while you're waiting, you should like and subscribe. You have plenty of time. And what's behind it? Some basilisks that are pretty easy to put down, and the coffin. And finally, we can come to the main gripe that I have with Scholar. What the fuck is this enemy placement? In the original, there were still two ogres here that were enough of a deterrent that unless you were very confident, you could simply not tackle them until later. But you could push down the tree and give yourself the shortcut so that you didn't have to go through the whole path again. Awesome! Good tutorial design that makes the encounter with two ogres memorable so that you want to come back and tackle them. Is looking at a statue as memorable as getting your ass kicked? No. But what makes this encounter worse is that Scholar has a fucking pursuer that spawns here too. Why would you put it there if not to make the two ogres even harder to deal with for no reason? It's so indicative of the rest of Scholar's design and <laughs> we've only just started, so let's move on. Oh no. Literally the next level. Forest of Fallen Giants, on the whole, looks good. There's an ogre here now. It's fine since you're not getting ganked, but I can see this being a problem, especially for new players. The Hide Knight being gone is weird, but okay. I liked him being there since he gives you a little extra challenge if you're feeling cocky after that big arena, but you don't have to fight him. Enemy placement isn't massively different so far some more enemies here and there, and the last giant is the exact same. Okay, cool. So, now that I've got the soldier key, let's go to the places locked behind those pesky doors. The run to Pursuer is the exact same, except there are those knights from the Lost Bastille here now. Why are they here? Don't ask questions. The Pursuer fight is the exact same. Giant Lord's door is guarded by a cyan knight that doesn't attack you unless you get super close. This is fine. I thought it was weird that this big place was so empty in vanilla. Well, okay, in New Game Plus it's not. This is... This is going to get annoying to clarify. The other door is where things get rough. Vanilla's version is also pretty bad with a pretty small area with not much of a reward for the fights you do here. And I should clarify that New Game Plus, even with the extra enemies, still isn't as bad as Scholar here. No, in Scholar, there are actually twice as many turtle dudes here now. And a slight spawn change on this roof that means that you have to fight two turtles at once. You have to fight them two on one in virtually every encounter with them instead of just the one two on one in vanilla New Game Plus. 
New Game Plus. Not only that, but there's an invader that also spawns here. And he has so much health for this stage of the game. These encounters honestly wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the frankly tiny arenas that you need to fight them. We'll see there's a lot more later, but DS2 and especially Scholar fucking loves to make you fight way too many enemies in not enough space to maneuver. This area is just the first notable time that it happens. And for the scant rewards this area actually provides, where's the incentive to come here at all? I get this is an optional area, but so is Ariamis. It doesn't excuse shit level design. <laughs> but... Am I just going to nitpick every level? And now we get to Hyde's Tower and things start to feel bad. The Hyde Knights being here makes sense. This area is called Hyde's Tower after all. And my thought process when I first played this area in Scholar was, Oh, I'll go kill Dragon Rider and come back for old Dragon Slayer. Just like I always do. Some quick levels to get ready for the rest of the game. Oh, how naive I was, dear viewer. There's a hide knight in front of the chest that used to contain green blossoms and now contains the ring of binding, so that's awful. Prior to killing Dragon Rider, the only way to open that chest is to kill him. And he's so nasty. You have to aggro him and back off that tiny platform you're on, or shoot him, I guess. Or come back to get it for the footage and two-shot him like I did. <laughs> That ring is pretty important to new players who need the help keeping their HP high while they learn the game, which, need I remind you, is very likely they haven't yet, at that literal second, third, if you count the things betwixt and you shouldn't, area of the game. Dragon Rider is literally the exact same. I fucked up the cheese in Scholar, but I got it in vanilla so it all balances. What's the worst thing is what comes after. All of the Hade Knights in the area are aggro now that you've killed Dragon Rider for some reason. This means that the fight, literally right next to the bonfire, now has a Hade Knight in it. The arena fight in this weird Colosseum area also has a Hade Knight. The double old knight fight on the way to the bridge has one. There's a spear one on the stairs. And those are awful. And after all that shit, there's a wyvern ready to taunt you as you try to cross. God forbid you engage that last night on the platform above because the wyvern will envelop the entire thing with fire. The wyvern itself isn't bad, just tanky, but the question is, why is all this shit here at all? My interpretation of the thought process is to incentivize the player to come back here when they're stronger so that they can deal with this side more easily. But once again, why? Did they change old Dragon Slayer to bring him in line with the huge increase in difficulty leading up to him? <laughs> Don't be fucking stupid, of course they didn't. They didn't change a single boss other than Nishandra and they did it in the stupidest possible way. But don't worry, we'll get there. Compare this to the run in vanilla. No hate nights at all, and even in New Game Plus the additions aren't overwhelming. The fight in the Colosseum has no extras except in New Game Plus where there's a hammer dude just chilling out in the back. There's an extra hammer dude on the platform before the bridge too. In New Game Plus there's just that sword and board guy. And for the area that's intended to be the beginning branch to go down, this design is much more conducive to learning than the clusterfuck that we get in Scholar. I have to stress, it's not the Hayden Knights themselves that are hard. Some are, like the Spear Bastards, but it's more that for some reason, DS2, and to an even greater degree Scholar, is obsessed with gank fights. Massive amounts of enemies that can individually pose a threat, but then cramming three, four, five, more? Into the space where one was originally. Hyde's Tower is the perfect example, but we'll see it a lot later too. How do we revamp the area? Put more annoying enemies in it so that instead of deaths being earned by making mistakes, we go out of our way to make death more common for the illusion of a challenging experience. The real mistake is expecting the game even to be good, am I right? 
No Man's Wharf is mostly fine. There's an extra fragrant branch here, so we'll keep that in our pocket for later. Thank God the Greatsword is still here. I'd be furious if they moved it to later in the game. I don't understand why Gavlan is in this room with a booby trap chest, but that's common to both games, so whatever. I tell a filthy lie, what I said about bosses not being changed before is wrong. Flexile Sentry is different. Oh, I hear you ask. Is his health pool different? No. Is his move pool different? Don't be ridiculous. No, what's different about the fight is that the water level rises way faster than it did in vanilla. Don't change the fight in any meaningful way that would take effort to animate or program. That's not what Scholar is about. What is it about, I hear you ask? I'll talk about that later. But for now, here's a nice easy way to limit your movement in a way that Sentry isn't affected by, so that your one meaningful method of defense in this game is hampered. Lovely. It's still a pushover, but that only begs the question of why did you even bother? Let's look at this level starting from No Man's Wharf, since there's not too much to talk about with the Tower of Partway. Getting off the boat and seeing this Varangian dude sleeping on the table was okay, but also slightly panic inducing, especially after you've just beat Flexile Sentry and might not be able to take him on. But the real criticism I have starts after the bonfire. First, there's no Hade Knight here. Whatever. He drops a weapon I never use, so I don't care really. The Bastille Knights start early here though, with one shooting from a wooden tower and another sword dude on another that will attack you as soon as you get down to ground level. And there are the dogs from Vanilla. Already pretty ganky, but to make it even worse, a fucking pursuer shows up in the middle of the arena. See what I mean about just throwing enemies into a space and calling it done? In Vanilla, there are dogs, a big dude on a tower for you to knock down, and that's it. In Scholar, let's go down the fucking list. Bastille Knight with a crossbow. Another one shooting from above you. Four dogs. And a pursuer. What the fuck? In addition to being already hilariously outnumbered, let's just throw in a boss you've only just beaten into the mix. This is DS2's design as a whole, but Scholars especially condensed down to one single arena. No space to separate enemies from each other, scant opportunity to give as much as you're forced to take, and for little to no reward to show for it after you actually beat it. The only caveat here is it's very easy to accidentally despawn the pursuer while backing off to heal, which makes the fight easier, but also frustrating if you actually intend to fight him and then he just fucks off. From the tower apart, the run is mostly the same except for a change here in Scholar that I think is actually much better than Vanilla. The Dull Ember is right here, instead of all the way in the Iron Keep. This is a little change that means a world of difference. To give the means for infusing nice and early in the game, this allows for more builds to get their start very early into their run. It's great, but I don't understand why it's here. Just sitting in a chest. In the Iron Keep it made sense. The entire place is on fire. It's made of iron. I can totally see why a smithing specific item is here. But I'll happily take an item being out of place if it means that there is more build freedom early in the game. I do think this room with the dogs and barrels is very satisfying though. It's also in vanilla, but just torching the whole room by knocking over a barrel is so cool. And honestly, this big empty space in vanilla being the arena for another pursuer fight is fine to me. It's a big empty space, except for these guys in New Game Plus, and ideally you've blown up the barrels and dealt with the enemies in the previous room, so this is just a straight fight in a large enough space. And a good reward too. Nice. Now coming up to the door in the Ruined Sentinels, in vanilla, just open it. In Scholar, another fucking petrified statue. Why? What does this add to the level? Sure, you can skip the Ruined Sentinels entirely by taking the side route through the hole in the wall. So you aren't completely gated from progress here, but what purpose does this statue serve other than to be irritating? To either divert the player to find that other route, or fucking wait for so long? 
Why is the animation of falling to the fucking floor slowly getting back up? All the while completely invincible, so fucking long. I'll get into this a lot more later, but this is such a stupid choice. Belfry Soul is the exact same, so no real need to talk about it. The gargoyles are stupid, but manageable. However, the run to it has a pursuer spawn here instead of a single dog in vanilla. Keyword here being instead. Both, in the dark, in this tiny room, would be incredibly stupid. Pursuer by himself here is fine. And the twinkling is nice. Two flexile sentries on the way to Lost Sinner instead of three abominations is a good choice, surprisingly. You can't cheese them into falling down the elevator hole, unfortunately, but they're slow enough that you can just run straight past, and you have enough space to run up the stairs without a big motherfucker breathing down your neck. And of course, the Lost Sinner is the exact same. Almost. The lighting in the arena is dark, but you can see the boss in the original. You can't lock on, but you can track the boss and see attacks coming. In Scholar, the entire arena is pitch black until Sinner is super close, and bizarrely, you can lock on when you can barely see her a lot of the time. They changed the lighting, but not the lock on distance apparently. It's a minor point, but it's still confusing to me why this game is so obsessed with making things even darker than they were. A quick comment about New Game Plus, I hate that there are pyromancers in this arena now. Sure they die quick, but making a pretty okay fight into a gank for seemingly no reason other than, well it's harder, is fucking stupid. This is the only fight this happens in too. <laughs> Here's an area where Scholar actually does improve on vanilla. I'd be remiss to talk about it because I think Shaded Ruins is so much better in Scholar. For one thing, there isn't the stupid giant basilisk just sitting here. He looks absolutely ridiculous. I know that there's one in Aldia's Keep too, but that makes a little more sense since Aldia's whole shtick is experimenting on things. Why is a giant basilisk here? Well, there are small basilisks here too, so why not? The next thing is the almost complete replacement of the Lion Mages with the Phantom enemies. While the Phantom enemies are annoying because you can't lock onto them, for this one brief level, the enemies are staggered far enough apart to actually have some good one-on-one -on -one fights for the entire level. It's like DS2 forgot how to be DS2 for one single area, and it's lovely. However, I don't like all the petrified statues in the area. You know why already. Especially here, where there are so many statues blocking chests and the like, and with the amount of fragrant branches at this stage of the game, i.e. fuck all, it doesn't feel like a reward for exploring, it feels like more come back later bullshit. God this level is a fucking mess. The literal first area in the level is a complete gank fest. I don't know how most players feel about falconers, but I really don't like them. They're way too fast, they combo really hard, and seemingly no matter which way you enter, you're gonna fight at least two at a time. In vanilla, there are just some farmers in here. Farmers and pigs. And in New Game Plus, there are two more big, big pigs. Makes sense. Not falconers and pigs, like in Scholar. Also, it's a minor touch, but the bonfire just being out here is pretty lame. In vanilla, the bonfire is in the middle of one of those tents, and it's just... Oh, it's really nice and cozy. I really like it in here. I think I'll stay here and ignore the horrors outside, thank you. Also, putting a mimic in this fucking tiny house is just idiotic. Better hope you have the damage to just kill this thing before it gets up, because good luck dodging in here. There's no major changes on the way to Magus and Congregation, but the rewards in that little illusory wall part just before are utter garbage compared to vanilla. Why? And of course, the quote-unquote boss is just laughable. I don't know why it's even counted as a boss. It's such a ridiculous fight. It's so stupid. It shouldn't exist in either version of the game. And there are so many. Fucking spiders after the congregation. Even the first room after the first zipline is packed with spiders. In the original, it's empty. 
These spiders have almost no wind-up for their hits, and in tiny rooms with no escape to heal, it's gonna get you killed. And getting down to the lower bonfire is horrible, because now there are, get this, instead of two spiders next to the bonfire, three in New Game Plus, there are five, which is lovely. You respawn just after dying later in the level and immediately get attacked by five fucking spiders. Outside the bonfire is somehow worse too, especially if you just run out the door and don't kill the spiders behind you. You leave to go to Ornifex's house, a billion fucking spiders follow you in addition to the wizards outside shooting at you. This area is an absolute disaster. Plus, the lighting is once again super irritating on the way to Freya. It's too dark, and the only way to figure it out is to carry a torch. I do like that the spiders here are scared of the torchlight though. It keeps Freya from being a ridiculous gank. But once again, I tested this. This is something in vanilla. But not in New Game Plus apparently, which is odd. In terms of moveset though, Freya is the exact goddamn same. The deflections off her carapace take way too fucking long and it's probably going to get you hit. But otherwise she's not awful. I do like that Vengal's body isn't here in Scholar though. It's a weird choice in vanilla to have it so far away from his head. I much prefer it being after Man Scorpion Tark. Not too much to go through here because the level isn't very different. The only noticeable change is not that big a deal since the enemies themselves die in one hit, or maybe two, is that instead of a single rogue ambushing you at the bridge lever in the original, there's the one rogue inside but three outside. Again, they group together nicely so that if you're using a greatsword like me, you can kill all three in a single hit essentially. But it does show that with a lower poise, or smaller weapon, or casting, this ambush could be pretty nasty. There's also an invasion where the crystal lizard is, which is pretty annoying if you need that twinkling. But the invader herself dies so quick it's barely an inconvenience, and you can just come back later for the lizard if you remember. Which I didn't. Mercifully, the undead lockaway key is in the same spot, so you can go back to it through the cave. This area is the same as it was, thankfully. Especially with the jump to the first wizard, if it was more ganky here, it would be awful to do that. Once again, the lighting in Scholar pretty much forces you to use a torch and light the sconces along the way, which sucks, but it certainly could be worse. And Skelly Lords are just as awful in Scholar as Vanilla. An absolute joke of a boss that doesn't even compensate you fairly for the time they fucking waste. Harvest Valley isn't too different, and it's a pretty short level, but there's enough here for us to talk about. First, this area just sucks. It sucks in vanilla, and it sucks in Scholar. Equal, but different suckage. Poison levels are just not fun, no matter how many ways you try and spin them, and this one is so long. The first major change is this lever to the second bonfire. In vanilla, there are two dark magic throwing giants here. As a quick aside, I always thought they sound like they're being steered by angry cats. They're easy to dodge and dispatch if you aren't an idiot like me, even though they're rather tanky. They really only have one move and it's easy enough to fight one without ever even aggroing the other. Not particularly interesting. What is far scarier is that in Scholar, two desert sorceresses are here now. I got lucky here in just running to the ladder, but if they caught me with pretty much any of their spells, I was probably just dead. It does make the little arena a little more exciting, so I don't think it's a bad change. Plus, you have the chance to get the desert sorceress gear and that shit is fucking peak fashion. I do think that it's cheeky to try and entice the player into falling down holes by using crystal lizards here. These lizards aren't here at all in vanilla. That being said, I don't think it's bad at all, it's some fun level design. It's a shame it's next to some of the worst in the whole game. This is actually the exact same for both versions, but I need to talk about it because it is so unbelievably indicative of what is considered difficulty in DS2. This tiny drop into the worst gank ever. There are four of these big hollows with sides on their arms, and the arena is almost impossible to get space in. In New Game Plus, there are five. 
That being said, I don't think it's particularly hard. It's only hard because it's so fucking slow to kite them around, wait for an opening from all four of these fatties to get one hit in because getting two is impossible without getting hit. The fight drags on for far too long. It's not fun in the slightest. And after all that, the rewards aren't amazing enough to justify it. Earth and Peak is fine. It's not super different from vanilla, so there's not much to talk about. The hammer guys before Covetous Demon have been replaced by a desert sorceress, which is surprisingly less ganky than vanilla. Also, I swear this jump is easier in Scholar. Covetous Demon, naturally, is the exact same. An absolute joke. And for some reason, there's another one in the Ivory King DLC, even though Covetous Demon's story is very specifically about one dude. After Covetous, there's a few more mannequins, but they're spaced evenly enough to not be annoying or overwhelming. There's a Grave Warden guarding the water wheel now, which is actually great. Why is he here? Well, to guard the water wheel that gets being set alight, of course. It's actually genius to indicate by the presence of an enemy that this axle is significant at all. I know I certainly missed burning the water wheel on my first playthrough of vanilla because it was never indicated. The position of this desert sorceress just before the bonfire above Mitha is different. She's been moved to closer to the chest and while that means that you can fight them one on one much more easily, her being so close to the chest here means that you could easily break it if you don't one-shot her. But that's it, really. I appreciate the chance to get some fashion, but these enemies are so outrageously hard-hitting. It's terrifying to get hit by one at all. They're rarely backed up by other enemies though, so the massive threat is mitigated somewhat by you just being able to rush them. Or shoot a poison jar next to them and watch them die. Mitha is, typically, the exact same. Frustrating to deal with, since she'll happily just sit in the poison moat and heal while you're sat there like, Hello? Can we get back to the fight once you're done with your fucking bath, please? She's not hard, just annoying. Oh boy. I am simply astounded by how wrong Iron Keep feels in Scholar. The most ridiculously ganky area outside the DLCs, particularly on the way to smelt a demon. In vanilla, the Alon Knights come in pairs, which is irritating but manageable. There's not much of a wind up to get you familiar with the enemy in vanilla, it just immediately throws two at you before you even open the door. An Alon Captain in New Game Plus before two more, and then three more in the room right before the big lava chamber. Scholar, to its credit, staggers the Alon Knights much more at the start of the area, with one on the bridge, then one being aggroed after you go in the door, then one up the stairs when you try to kill the one who would have shot at you if you went up the big stairs. It's some good, staggered enemy placement and a clear improvement. However, there are also not one, but two invasions at the door here. Neither of them are particularly tough, but the clear intent is to go in the door, aggro the Alon Knight, and have the invader come up behind you. This doesn't just happen once, but twice. You need to either dispatch the knight so fast that the threat is mitigated, or go over the invasion trigger without aggroing it in the first place. To get around being ganked, you need to go out of your way to manipulate the game to do what you need it to. Not incredibly uncommon in Dark Souls, but it still feels too gamey, especially here. All of this isn't too bad so far, even improvements in some aspects, but it all falls apart once you get past this door. After this door, all hell breaks loose. This wide open area is the most messy, gross, ganky area and so much worse than in vanilla. In vanilla, the Alon Knights are pretty nicely spaced to allow you to take out the first one while taking cover behind the bridge pillar run over and take out the archer on the lower platform in New Game Plus, the archer up the ladder above, let down the bridge so that you can get back up and take out the bridge archer, and then the area is now pretty much free of threats. If you don't count the archer up on the building you have to jump to. There's a small jump here before you get there though, and the dull ember is here in vanilla. I already talked about why this isn't good, but it certainly makes more sense to be here. 
In Scholar, you're attacked by a dude right out the door, then the same Elon Knight that you'd normally take cover while fighting. But this time, as you get closer to the bridge lever, another one further along aggros, and another drops from the platform above when you engage his buddy. Add in that the Elon captains shoot from much further away with very little cover to speak of, and it's a recipe for irritating fights. And once you drop both sides of the bridge, it gets even worse. Charging the archer on the bridge aggro's a sword dude to come fight you too. And on this tiny arena with two Alon captains able to shoot you, it's awful. After taking them out, there are two more that aggro once you get all the way across. Not only this, but while that little jump is gone, in its place is another Alon knight and Alon captain. There's just one more Alon captain before the smelter demon, but this area is fucking stupid and predictably smelter demon is the exact same he's cool rather basic in his fight but he's very satisfying still the pursuer still spawns in the arena after you kill smelter and good god that ring of blades is so nice to get everything after is pretty similar to vanilla but with the super fucking lame change of moving the enemies on the raised platforms to the bits that don't fall in the lava Boo. the whole fun of this bit is to drop dudes in lava look how satisfying this is man come on and of course the old iron king is the same such a garbage boss for a great lord soul owner a thrilling boss who is dodged by walking around the arena and he has barely any health, which is a mercy because fuck, this fight is boring. This area fucking sucks. In terms of enemy layout, I didn't notice too much of a difference, but this is where my gripes about lighting really come into play. In the pitch black of the gutter, you're really forced to use a torch here and it very much limits your options in terms of moveset. If you need to two-hand a weapon to deal with a tighter space, get fucked. Also, this area has so many pitfalls that you can usually avoid if you can see them, and in Scholar it is much harder to do that, especially without a torch. I have to light sconces so that when I die from some random bullshit like falling through the fucking floor, when there's no visual indicator that that can happen, I don't have to use my torch for the next run. Notice that I navigated the entire gutter in the dark in my vanilla footage, which allowed me to switch from one hand to two hand depending on the enemy or groups of enemies that I was facing pretty freely. I'd never be able to do that in Scholar unless I'd like, memorized the level. It's the exact same, except for two easy invasions and another fucking petrified statue, oh my god! The Rotten isn't changed at all, of course. It makes sense that the Rotten is so easy, since it's arguably at the end of the most direct route from Majula. But easy bosses can also be fun. Take Cleric Beast, for example. DS2 and Bloodborne were being made at the same time, and while Cleric Beast is also an easy boss, there's much more involvement here than just walk in, get a swing or two, walk out, watch him whiff, walk back in. Man, the rotten is really boring. Surprisingly, not too much is different here. There's an extra cyan knight here with the portrait of Nishandra, but it's really just fine since they don't all aggro at once. One thing that is an interesting but not necessarily bad change is that instead of a bunch of regular dudes like a mastodon, cyan knights, and a long archers in vanilla, there's an undead chariot horse? Can someone explain to me the lore behind this? To be clear, it's not bad, it's much less annoying and ganky, it's just a strange choice. Also, this chest is a mimic now. But this room right after that is a really nasty change. To finally get back to the central castle bonfire, you need to go through here, and in vanilla, empty. You fought through the entire castle to get back here, Here's a nice spot to catch your breath and get a flask shard. Good job. In Scholar, there are two desert sorceresses in here. 
Again, the sorceresses are very squishy, so the threat is short-lived, but two of the hardest hitting enemies in the game staggered far enough apart that if you kill the first, you may still get hit by the second doing so. The only real way to tackle this is to already know that this is coming and run in and kill them before they can kill you. It doesn't feel like good design, it feels needlessly punishing for being so close to the end of this loop. Hey, remember the level people complained that even back in vanilla was too punishing in Genki? What if we made it worse? Shrine of Amana in vanilla after playing Scholar is pretty okay actually. In New Game Plus there are a few more enemies and I did die a lot here. Some stupid frustrating ganks and the damage of the wizards is ridiculous for the tracking their missiles have. And the Archdragon Acolytes are notoriously annoying to deal with since they have ridiculously fast attacks and pretty high poise damage. But the enemies are usually pretty spaced out to be able to take no more than two at a time usually, except for this one awful bit in New Game Plus. And the wizards being easily accessible makes the area not as hard as we first thought it was. Still not good, but it's okay. Scholar's version is so much worse. There are way more wizards, and I swear their tracking is even worse. There's a fucking old knight here for some reason, and this wizard right here is so unbelievably sneaky. She doesn't aggro when you fight the old knight, unlike the one further up, but once you go engage that one, the one behind you will shoot you in the back. And there's another one in this narrow hallway, so you have to choose to fight one of these two new wizards while likely getting shot by the others. This run up to the second bonfire is so stupidly annoying with the amount of added wizards. Engaging the Archdragon Acolytes while being shot at by twice as many wizards. I don't even have as much to add here as the other encounter because that actually felt like there was some actual thought put into the design. This is just putting a whole bunch more enemies in here. There is no fucking design. It fucking sucks. There are also more enemies after the second bonfire in this weird courtyard area. I usually get a bow specifically for this area. I hate it. I don't care if it feels cheesy, this area sucks ass and is very indicative of Scholar's design philosophy. If you went in here guns blazing, there are lizard men, archdragon acolytes, wizards, and an invader here. Being outnumbered with very little cover or chance to separate enemies in the water means you're gonna fucking die. The answer? Grab out a bow and start shooting. It's the only thing that makes sense. Demon of Song is the same and it still sucks. Long periods of invulnerability while it sits doing nothing is not fun boss design. Good thing it doesn't have much health so you don't need to wait for many openings. What's not necessarily bad but interesting is the road to the Milfinito Shrine. In vanilla, there's a Hexer here. They're very squishy and not hard at all, but in Scholar there's a pretty nasty Pyromancer here instead. The question is, why? At the expense of diving into lore for a second here, Hexes channel the dark of humanity's essence, whereas Pyromancy does not. So I feel like the Hexer here is much more thematic, if not as challenging. Most of this level is the same, and the run to Velstad is so stupid in vanilla, but both better and worse in Scholar. The hollow that rings the bell is still very frustrating to kill without hitting the bell, but Instead of two more Cyan Knights, there's a Dragon Rider here. What makes it better compared to Vanilla is that once this Dragon Rider dies, it doesn't respawn. But on the other hand, unless you run past like I somehow managed to, it means that you have to fight an admittedly quite weak boss right before you have to fight another. It's just needlessly mean. Velstad is the same of course. I remember my first playthrough of Vanilla, and Velstad was the wall I simply couldn't get over. Looking back on it now, I don't really see how. You can simply walk around him. Just like most bosses, his counterplay is literally moving slightly out of the way. It's funny, but also very sad that the run to him is by far the hardest part of his fight, because he does look very cool. Vendrick is also the same. Naturally, I came back to fight him after I got all the giant souls, but the moveset is the same regardless of how many you have. 
but he's very boring. It's the medic, you know, a great king laid low by the curse of the undead, but the fight design is so bad. He's slow, he's boring, he can literally be walked around and beaten in your fucking sleep. This is a kind of nitpicky complaint since Odia's Keep isn't too different between versions, but it's such a lame and stupid thing to get rid of the dragon skeleton that attacks you in the front atrium here. I don't know if I missed a trigger or something, but I never got the dragon to attack. This moment is so awesome. When I think about cool parts of DS2, this is what I think about, and to just not have it is pretty sad. This is a complaint common to both versions, but I hate this bit here with opening the doors. If you somehow didn't know by this stage that you could cancel out of opening doors, you're guaranteed to get hit here. Ogre upon ogre in a row, and none of it is fun. Mercifully, once these doors are open, slash walls are knocked down, that's how they stay though. And Guardian Dragon is just so stupid. I hate him. This fight isn't interesting. This fight isn't challenging, you just fucking wait for this stupid bird to fly up into the air, shoot some fire, land for three seconds, and then repeat. I can't confirm this, but I do think that Scholar's version does stay grounded for longer than Vanilla's, which is nice. There are so many more exploding hollows here in Scholar. If you want to fight the Wyverns, which you probably should for the upgrade materials, then it means that you're gonna get attacked by exploding hollows while you're focusing on the wyvern. The worst example is the drop here. You drop into the wyvern fight, and I genuinely get stun locked by hollows here while all my equipment breaks. I couldn't even see the hollows past the body of the wyvern, so I just get absolutely juggled. I don't understand why this fight is like this. Does this fight improve the player experience? Or is it just stupid and annoying, and worst of all, fucking expensive to repair everything. This is the first, and only, level that is objectively better than the original, but even here I do have some nitpicks. I think that the Dragon Knights wanting you to take one-on-one -on -one fights and only engaging you if you run away is a really nice touch. They value honor in combat and these fights really reflect that. This fight up the stairs is so awesome. The Dragon Knight Power Stance in Greatswords is a tough fight, but it really feels like you've defeated their champion and now they respect you for coming this far. My nitpick is that it isn't communicated to the player at all. If Ben Hart was here or something, an NPC that the player knows and wants to talk to, and they explained even something nebulous like, sorry, this is probably going to get offensive. Hey, the Dragon Knights here value honor above all else then maybe you could get it. But we'll talk about why they wouldn't have done something like this later. If you run past, the only time you'd know something is up is when it's already too late. You could get trapped by the door here and ganked, or just completely mobbed on the stairs. And naturally, the Ancient Dragon is the same. What's interesting though, is that this cheese strat is essentially the only way to reliably kill him at all. I can't imagine fighting him legit without hugging his left foot. Since his fight then breaks down into three easily avoided moves, his enormous health pool and boring move loop makes this a slog rather than a cool climactic fight at the top of the shrine. Nishandra was so much easier in vanilla. She's an absolute pushover for the quote unquote final boss of DS2, and it was very underwhelming. So, Scholar made her harder. How, you ask? By adding more curse orbs. In vanilla, which I lost the footage of, she has one single curse orb. In New Game Plus, she has three. In Scholar, she has five. And nothing else. It certainly makes the fight harder by cranking up tick damage and cursing you every three seconds, but what does this improve in the fight? Or does it just make it cheaper? The boss quality of DS2 as a whole is pretty bad, but quote unquote improving the boss by putting extra adds into the fight is the worst possible way of attempting to do that. Many moments have come and gone.
One round of poison and the other was a chocolate to flame. Still another slumbers in the realm of ice. Not one of them stood here. As you do. Now. You, conqueror of adversities. It was your answer. While excellent for the theme of Scholar, Aldia's fight is fucking shit. He wants to test you one final time, and it's perfect for his character and is trying to push you to reject the first flame and let it fade. However, his fight is so boring, oh my god. He has no real dynamics to his fight at all. You might dodge a couple of times, but it really is just wait for five minutes for the fire to go down, hit, wait for the fire to go down, hit, and then win. If you wanted to do something cool with the end of the game, adding a stupid fight that wastes your time is not the way to do it. I do have to admit that the new ending is much cooler though. I think that's enough ranting about levels and bosses. Do you guys remember the opening of DS2? It was a while ago, so I'll forgive you, but remember this line? Oh, I'll fool you no longer. You lose your souls. All of them. Over and over again. <laughs> yeah. That didn't happen. After DS2 came out, there were a lot of comments that it was pretty easy compared to DS1. I think a lot of this had to do with the better controls though. Rolling in cardinal directions was an idiotic idea and DS2 giving the rolls the freedom they needed was very welcome. But vanilla DS2 was pretty easy, yeah. I think I died like once when I wasn't overshooting that stupid jump in Earthen Peak. The enemies were forgivingly spaced, but it also meant that areas were pretty cruisy to get through. And buses themselves were overwhelmingly easy and uninteresting. But we've already talked about most of them. So, for Bandai Namco, FromSoft's publisher for most of its titles, to lean so heavily into the You're gonna fucking die, buddy! marketing so hard, the game being easy was pretty embarrassing, to be honest. As a quick side note, while I was editing this, I went and I had a look at the trailer for the original release of Dark Souls 2, and the first line, the first line is, you will die, that much is certain. And it's like, oh god, this is so embarrassing. Two years later, the PS4 and Xbox One are coming out, and it can make games that are much nicer looking than the horrible ugly garbage on the PS3 and Xbox 360. So, a graphical update for a game that was pretty lacking in the looks department like DS2 was warranted. And it certainly looks much nicer. However, in addition to a graphical update, Scholar was the perfect opportunity to make the game tougher. So, some changes were made. I know it doesn't seem like it after dunking on Scholar for this long, but I can appreciate some game design like this. There's a frustrating joy to games like I Wanna Be The Guy or Super Meat Boy, but it has no place in Souls. Ideally, in a Souls game, there should never be a challenge that you cannot be fully equipped to tackle. Apart from the lighting engine, which I imagine would have been expensive, everything that we've talked about so far is the reuse of assets the game already had. Want to make your game harder, but don't want to spend the money doing the redesign it actually needs? Add more mobs to the levels, make timers go faster in the case of Flexile Sentry, and use the lighting to do all the work for you. Don't bother with moveset changes to bosses to make fights more engaging, we're scraping this together to get it out for early releases on PS4! The issue with this is that while sure, it does make the game harder, it's not done in any satisfying or interesting ways. There's no new enemies, only different ones you already know. The bosses aren't improved, just toughened in ways that don't make them more fun to fight. And with both the game's obsession with cramming in bosses, you'd hope that any improvements to be made would be centered around bosses and improvements to them. However, something that should stand out to you by now is that no bosses in Scholar 
or even changes to the ones that they had already. The most beloved part of DS1, that DS2 desperately tried to build on and didn't, weren't improved in any meaningful way from Vanilla to Scholar. I truly don't understand why, other than the speculation that they simply didn't want to animate more moves and cut costs. Aldia is the perfect example of this. A boss that doesn't move on his own and simply teleports around the arena to avoid more animating. His model itself doesn't do much except for some warping of his single texture, and he spawns branches that also don't animate much. His fight feels easy and cheap because, well, it is. Down to his design itself, everything about him feels like a cost-cutting measure while still giving the illusion of meaningful extra content. No, the major changes come in the form of new level design. The areas specifically make the level design even more grating because I imagine that even without playing vanilla, it would be clear to realize that the original intent and design for areas wasn't like this. Enemy placement feels random at best and cheap at worst. It's such a strange choice to actively break the design of the original in the singular goal of making the game harder. Instead of improving the level design and quality of enemy design, which would be expensive, the answer that they had was simply to just add more. And no enemy shows this off more than... You can't escape me! The Pursuer is pretty cool. He looks awesome even though he skips leg day, his sword looks awesome even though it sucks, and he's a good intro boss that shows you some cool concepts that never get touched on again. At least until New Game Plus. Being able to beat him before his boss fight and thus give yourself a little more challenge is cool, but this one encounter and the fight after the smelter is all you get in vanilla, which I think is fine. It's not a super interesting fight even though he looks cool, I don't think he's that remarkable. Scholar certainly disagrees with me though. There are pursuers everywhere. Three new pursuers in the Lost Bastille, in the Things Was Twixt for some fucking reason. The list is long and baffling. Most of his new fights aren't even one on one, so while the health of the pursuer inflates as the game progresses, we're also adding other enemies into the mix. As I touched on before, things betwixt and the Lost Bastille are especially bad in this. Particularly for so early in the game, getting swamped with adds while dealing with a more tanky version of the same fucking boss you just fought is infuriating. The question bears repeating though. What does this add to the experience and level design? Some nice rewards, maybe, but if they're the results of frustrating fights, then many players just won't engage with it. And since the pursuer despawns if you leave his tiny fucking engagement area, he refuses to let you kite adds and fight him afterwards. You have to fight him at the same time. Speaking of more tough enemies being plonked into levels without thinking, though. I gotta sing the God, there are so many NPC invaders now. That being said, I don't think calling these invaders tough is accurate. Tanky is much better. Because most of the NPC invaders are fucking stupid. This guy is in the DLZ, but perfect to show what I mean. I don't even fight him. I wondered if it was even possible to kill him this way, so I just walked around the scots and he just <laughs> he just fucking burned himself to death i actually laughed out loud but the whole reason i had this idea was because every fucking npc invader is like this brain dead ai that is there to exacerbate gankiness and reduce fun not a single npc other than maybe the forlorn and jester thomas in the iron king dlc are hard to fight so, they need to pull some pretty lame tricks to get them to be threatening. But why is this such an issue? I've spent maybe an hour talking about this, but I still haven't really explained why this is such a big deal. So, let's get into it. Stop it. Get some help. I have spent a long time in this video complaining about ganks, but why are they bad in the first place? Plenty of games have you against massive amounts of enemies, and you're by your lonesome shredding them. I don't have footage of Dynasty Warriors, so pretend it's here. 
This isn't the only example, but let's think about what makes those games conducive to that structure. Attacks with huge AoEs, cameras far enough away to see what you're doing while surrounded by enemies on all sides, and individual enemy attacks don't hurt that much. Have you noticed what the fucking issue is yet? That is virtually the exact opposite of Souls design. These games are by far at their best when facing one enemy at a time, or if there are multiple enemies with aggro scripting that they charge in staggered timing or terrain slash distance to separate them so that you can take them one on one. And as we've seen in our extensive shredding of most of Scholar, that's not what it does. The encounters typically only have one or maybe two enemy types. So even if you do have the distance, they all move the exact same speed, so you can't separate them that way. The camera is also really close to the player, so any attacks from behind have milliseconds of warning if there isn't an obvious sound cue. Frozen Outskirts isn't particularly ganky, but it does show this well. How many times have you just been hit in the back because the only warning something is coming is a sound cue that's impossible to learn the timing of because you can't fucking see it? DS2 in general, but Scholar especially, relies on the camera obscuring a lot of its enemies and their attacks, particularly ranged attacks just fucking nailing you from off screen and softening you up for the clusterfuck on the ground around you. The result is a lot of deaths, because the fights you encounter in Scholar are so antithetical to the combat design that it just kills you unfairly. Levels are choked with enemies to the point that you can barely fucking see each one for the mess of bodies on screen. Speaking of not seeing, though... I'm going to have to put on my fucking double seeing glasses! The lighting in Scholar, on the whole, looks really nice compared to vanilla. As a purely aesthetic choice, I definitely like it as an inclusion. However, the question I need to ask here is, what does it achieve in terms of the design of the levels? And on the whole, not much. Most areas are brightly lit, and the new lighting allows them to have a lot more vibrance than DS1 did, for example. But, this improvement drastically affects the design of the darker levels. Visibility and being able to identify ahead of time what enemies you're facing and strategizing accordingly is pretty important in Souls, and by making areas so damn dark, it makes it impossible to play correctly without a torch. And I've already talked about why that's shit. We have to go back! Another great way to pad out your game and force players into annoying fights to make your game seem harder is to force them to backtrack. And what easier way in DS2 than to plant petrified statues everywhere? They stall the progress of the player in a way that isn't challenging in the slightest, and if you have a branch, add nothing to the gameplay other than about 80 fucking years of waiting for the statue to revivify. While the most direct change to actual progression of levels, it feels like a cynical way to add more Metroid into the Metroidvania label the critic community gave DS1, for some reason. The issue that I have with that label is that DS1 isn't really a Metroidvania. Sure, you progress to another area to find a key that unlocks somewhere else, but the level design of DS1 complemented that perfectly. By having the levels be so interconnected, the game could get away with putting keys in other areas because you'd probably end up back there by accident anyway. In DS2 though, with its rather linear level layout, this just isn't as satisfying. Finding items that unlock things from completely different routes adds this level of non-cohesion that DS1 just didn't have. Backtracking is so completely antithetical to the design of most of the levels in DS2 that it genuinely feels confusing. If most of the levels are meant to just be traversed through, never to be heard from again, the strange choice to have a scant few levels that are intended to be backtracked, usually for quite insignificant payoff, just feels so inconsistent. And the ones that can be backtracked don't ever add another path to progression because that would add some frustration to the player and halt their progress. No, instead the backtracking paths don't even have the conviction to actually matter, they're just optional areas with little point at all. If the levels are being quote unquote enhanced, 
by adding a branching path that achieves nothing, has it really been enhanced? Fuck no. I've talked a lot about the New Game Plus changes made in vanilla, since that's the footage I decided to go with instead of starting a new character. And to be clear, some changes, like the pyromancers in the Lost Sinner fight I mentioned, I don't like very much. DS2 gets a lot of praise for making meaningful changes between NT Plus cycles, and I certainly appreciate it too, even though the vast majority of changes simply make the game more ganky. The difference between NG Plus Vanilla and Scholar is though, you've had an entire NGE cycle to build your character and get familiar with the game. When the game ramps up in difficulty and gankiness in New Game Plus, you should be equipped to take it, instead reacting to the surprise of more stuff rather than being overwhelmed. And that feeling of being overwhelmed in so many of Scholar's encounters is what makes it so fucking aggravating. Visually, it looks so much nicer and preserves a lot of what made vanilla so good, but takes away a lot of that build-up and just plonks it into new game without the prior knowledge or reward for clearing the game first. Not only that, but many encounters are specifically built harder and gankier than even New Game Plus had them. It feels like a challenge mod rather than a tightly designed and curated experience. On that note, New Game Plus is certainly an improvement on the base game in a few key ways, but I don't think that that should be a good thing when you consider that these improvements usually occur in areas that were originally empty in New Game. Vanilla deliberately holds things back for New Game Plus, and I think that that's another reason why I think the tighter, more consistent level design of DS1 is better for me. Sure, there aren't any changes except for health pools and damage being bigger, and that does keep the levels from having that new feeling again. But the level is already designed to be exactly what it is, and the game recognises that adding more would be too much. In DS2, the levels are mostly built for new game, and any additions make it feel too claustrophobic, while the areas left empty for enemies to be added in New Game Plus stand out as far too conspicuous. You know what doesn't change in New Game Plus though? The DLCs. And they're still not great. Here's probably the hottest take of the video, and this is why I left it to the end. We've been building to this chapter the whole video, and this is why. The DLCs really are the culmination of all we've been talking about. And since they came out before Scholar, we can see the design ethos of the DLCs is very indicative of the monstrosity that Scholar would become. The DLCs love cramming in masses of enemies into tight spots for you to get ganked by. Now let me be clear, I don't think it's as bad as Scholar's changes, which is why I won't be going level by level here. But there are a few examples that I want to talk about. First up, in the Iron King DLC, this chamber right here is just stupid. Once again, we find ourselves in an area that is far too open, not allowing you to properly space out enemies and take them one at a time, where the combat feels less overwhelming. No, instead, you either have to fall down a trapdoor, or go down a ladder to be greeted by three enemies, two soldiers and a big lava guy all at once. You can push down barrel guys to try and kill some of them early, but even that has its risks. Not only that, but the icon of Nadalia is also here to buff enemies and cast Firestorm. This area is so indicative of the new design philosophy of DS2. Gank the player so that instead of being tough but fair gameplay we've all grown to love about Souls, instead, it's just tough. Next up is the gank squad in the Sunken King. This boss fight sucks ass. Even with the enormous damage my pretty standard strength build can dish out, gank fights are stupid and annoying. The Havel clone being able to stagger you so the other gankers can get hits in is an interesting concept in theory, but in practice it's fucking stupid. It doesn't feel like a fair fight on a design level. Being outnumbered in souls is fine on the occasions when you have the space to kite and separate them out, 
and the arena here does help with that. But, the enemies are so nasty and the cover you get from the archer usually puts you in water to slow you, so it just feels like too much of the game trying to tilt things in the ganker's benefit, instead of being relatively even with the mobility options you'd normally have. Next, we have the fucking bastard asshole porcupine area in the Ivory King. Even being next to these little pricks, they do outrageous amounts of tick damage. And, they usually come in pairs. This bit here in this tiny hallway is more lethal than most of the entire DLC, because the porcupines prevent you from getting past, and the extremely cramped hallway means that if you try to engage here, you're gonna die. If an enemy purely provides frustration instead of a true challenge, it shouldn't be here. And just one, by themselves as annoying as it is, but they're almost never alone. And last, you knew it was coming, is the frozen outskirts. What the fuck? What the fuck is this? This shows just how reliant on obscured visibility Scholar became. The frozen outskirts is a MASSIVE area, with Kirins that spawn seemingly exclusively behind you, and with the extremely Limited visibility, navigation without looking up a guide is an exercise in frustration. The area is just a path of boring buildings to sort of be used as landmarks, but it's not enough. The visibility means you might never see a building at all before you die, and the progression is entirely meaningless if you die without ever figuring out how the area even works. And of course, the boss is just a double fight of a boss you've already fought. God, this area is so shit. When people think about the Crown DLCs though, they think about the bosses. And I agree, the main bosses in the DLCs are very cool. Sin is a very cool and tough dragon whose durability gimmick is pretty nasty, but I never noticed it in my fight. His hitboxes are enormous though, and I swear I get out of the way of his fireballs and still get hit. Such an awesome design though, and apart from Midia, probably the coolest looking dragon boss. Fume Knight is fucking cool, and has a nice moveset that helps the phase change have more impact. Plus, Fume Ultra Greatsword is just so badass, come on. There's a reason it's one of the few things from DS2 that made it into DS3. But, he's way too hard if you miss some Smelter Witches, which is pretty fair if you rightfully want to skip some nasty gank fights. I had to look up where to find the last ones, and that shows you just how unenthusiastic I was to explore Broom Tower, where everything is tight corridors with way too many enemies. Alon is awesome too. I love his design, and while I didn't get it in the footage, defeating him without getting hit and making him seppuku is such a cool touch. Plus, he has a surprisingly varied moveset for DS2 bosses, and his buff being contingent upon landing grabs on you is both cool and really nasty. But the run to his fight is fucking awful. It is so ridiculously ganky and annoying, the only saving grace being that once you know kinda where to run to, to avoid enemies, it's very short. And the old Ivory King is both really cool and really lame. Assembling the Avengers and going to war with the Chaos Knights is fun, but the gank is real here. It's nice that the Chaos Knights also attack the Lois ones, but there's a good chance you'll have to take on two or three Chaos Knights at once. And the Ivory King himself usually has one final Chaos Knight that spawns in during his fight. A tough boss with some pretty fast and strong attacks that also has an add is pretty gross. The last Lois Knight you have might take aggro sometimes, but you're probably going to get ganked. So there are some pretty major flaws in the design of even the coolest fights that are in the DLCs, and there are a lot more fights that are just not that. Blue Smelter is stupid even though he kind of looks cool. But I do like how he mixes up timings of attacks, so he's not a direct clone of Red Smelter. The run to his arena is fucking stupid though. 
if you fuck up the run through the hallways to make it in time for the gates to close behind you, you just die. You'll get blasted from the salamander turret as well as get ganked by all the soldiers chasing you from behind. Gank Squad's run is equally stupid, even if it's not quite as ganky. Instead, the lighting and some confusing areas made worse by the darkness mean that navigation in here is very annoying. I've already talked about the fight itself, so I'll leave this bit here. Lud and Zalin are made even worse by their run back. You don't get a bonfire next to their boss room, so you need to run through the entirety of the frozen outskirts again if you die. And since the hitboxes last so fucking long with the kitty cats, it's quite likely. Even Alana is just not fun. A slightly more interesting version of Nishandra, she does the classic DS2 move at this stage and summons adds into the fight, even summoning a copy of Velstad for some reason here. And you know how I feel about ads in boss fights now. The boss design has to be unbelievably solid to make it work, and Alana is not that. Virtually no bosses in Souls are balanced like that, and it takes careful design that DS2 does not do at all. But Xander, I hear you say, what's the alternative here? What could DS2 have done to be harder while avoiding the things you've spent this long talking about? Well, let's think about this then. The next part is just kind of spitballing about my platonic ideal of Scholar. It's clear I don't like the vast majority of changes, but that isn't to say that I think changing the game was necessarily the worst idea. Obviously, I don't think the execution was good, but vanilla DS2 is far from perfect too. And the first big video on this channel was me praising the changes of FF7 Remake, so I think I've demonstrated that I'm certainly not a purist when it comes to remakes of games. So I think this change, plus the ones I said were already good, could be a cool way to start. There's a fascinating comparison that I would have completely missed if I hadn't fucked up the footage of my NG playthrough, and that is that Scholar feels like a new game character playing through New Game Plus, but worse. And I thought about this for ages because I knew of a game that did this extremely well. And right before finishing this video, it hit me. Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter is a series that gets New Game Plus more right than basically any other series that I've played. While technically not new game cycles, the changing hunter ranks from low to high to G slash master are effectively new game cycles. But what makes it such a great comparison in my mind is that there are also changes between those cycles. There's more story in higher ranks and more monsters to fight, but what I really want to focus on here is the monsters that you've already fought. The low rank monsters that are leveled up to high and master ranks not only have their health and damage upgraded, and have the same familiar moves, but also brand new ones too, or extensions to combos that they had earlier. This is a great way to emphasize what's actually important in Monster Hunter, the fucking monsters. While still a familiar fight, you're forced to learn additions and modifications to movesets that make achieving a higher rank exciting and keeps the game not only fresh, but constantly challenging. Now imagine if this is what we got in Scholar. Some area changes to make them more streamlined, like in the Dragon Shrine, but much more focus on the boss fights that the game is already saturated with. Give bosses new animations and attacks so that they feel more complex and engaging. Get AI scripting to be more aggressive so that bosses can no longer be simply walked around. Get rid of adaptability entirely and make attacks faster so that stamina management becomes much more of an issue. In New Game Plus, pull a Monster Hunter and instead of adding more mobs to levels, mix up boss combos even more. I don't know, man. It feels like Monster Hunter gets right what Scholar was trying to do, and it really just bums me out. In my mind, I can see what Scholar could have been, instead of this ganky, frustrating mess we could have got Master Rank DS2. And it really sucks that we didn't. Okay, let's wrap this up. Thank you for making it this far. 
I hope I've gone into enough detail to show why Scholar didn't improve the DS2 experience like I hoped it would. There's certainly more that I could have talked about, like when I touched briefly on item relocation, but the major sticking point for me, clearly, was enemy placement and the clash between Vanilla's design that was maybe a little lacking but much more intentional, or Scholar's design that is much harder but not in any enjoyable way. The ridiculous enemy placement, the petrified statues slamming progress to a halt for no reason, the lighting obscuring levels and enemies in ways that aren't fun, and the lack of attention to bosses outside of the easiest and least interesting ways. The weird focus on backtracking to earlier levels to fight bosses that were intended as early fights and never changed. And while the DLCs indicated that this new mentality would be the case, it's the changes to the levels present in vanilla that are the most egregious examples of how not to design a Souls game. Thankfully, DS3 mostly learned from this. Oh god, I'm gonna have to make a video about DS3 now, huh? Scholar is a fascinating example of how to remake a game that completely misses the point. In the pursuit of meeting expectations of difficulty, the design of DS2 was actively made worse. Instead of making Scholar a fun, fresh challenge, it's just a fucking slog, and I'm glad I don't have to play it anymore. Thank you so much for watching. This video has taken a long time to make, so if you could hit like and subscribe, it would really mean a lot. While you're down there, leave a comment and let me know what you think about this topic. Do you prefer Scholar? I'd really like to hear some more opinions on this, so please let me know. Also thank you to Jupiter for the thumbnail as always. I have a lot of videos in the works, so hopefully I'll have something out soon, and I'll see you then.